Very good afternoon to all of you once again. I'm ever so thankful to have you as always join us. We left off in 1 Kings 19 with the drought has now ended. The three and a half years of a drought has now ended in the northern kingdom of Israel where Ahab and Jezebel are still on the throne. Even in 1 Kings 20, they're still on the throne right here. And Elijah just comes out of this major depression. He goes and anoints Elisha, and he'll be his successor. We now pick up in what many would view as a war chapter. And I believe that there's a lot more happening in this chapter than just simply two nations going to war. And the two nations that I'm speaking on are the Syrians right up here against the kingdom of Israel. Now, the kingdom of the, the northern kingdom of Israel, this they would have been weakened by this three and a half years of famine. Most certainly, a lot of people have died at this time, even a lot of the army. They're weakened, and the Syrians know this. The chapter begins like this. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria, and warred against it. And Ben-Hadad sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also, and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. So this Syrian king, Ben-Hadad, in whom we're not certain if it's the same Ben-Hadad that Asa aligned himself with against Baasha. We're not for certain that this may be his son or his grandson. We're not sure. But anyway, he is telling Ahab, all your silver, your gold are mine, your wives also, and your children, even the best of them, are all mine. I mean, that's, I'd put up a fight before I allowed that. What does Ahab do? And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. He immediately capitulates, immediately surrenders to this king. Let's talk just a little bit about Ahab. Ahab, this king of Israel at the time of Elijah the prophet, the husband of Jezebel, he reminds me so much of these modern leftists today left of center in the political realm. He reminds me so much of these. He's very whiny. Above all things, Ahab was notorious for being weak. Personality. His character was very, very weak. His uh, wife Jezebel, she was a very feminist type of individual. She wore the pants in the family. She told Ahab everything to do. He's very, very weak. But also, he was um, easily influenced very easily influenced. Whichever way the wind was blowing that day, that's the way that he would go. He wasn't a strong man, didn't have a spine in the figurative sense. He was very cowardly. He was fearful of conflict. He was also unable to receive wise guidance. And the Bible tells us that the fool will reject wise, the uh, words of wisdom. Ahab would war against good just because he wanted to appease evil. Whatever the evil crowd said to do, you know, the pro-choice, the feminist, and the, you know, the destruction of the nuclear family, whatever that side, the evil side wanted to do, he would do anything in order to please them. Much like the Antifa members today. How they, they'll, they'll fight, but they have to have help they, unlike King David, Ahab always seems to have to have someone helping him in a, in a battle. He's, he's terrified. But also notice this, how the, the Antifa members, they'll wear a mask. They always conceal themselves out of fear. They're afraid of anyone knowing who they are, doxing them, um, fearful of the police, fearful of retaliation. Well, Ahab does the exact same thing in his chapter 22 battle against this very same Ben-Hadad that we're talking about. He does the very same thing. He disguises himself. He doesn't want to dress like the king. He even tells Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, to keep his royal apparel on, but he wants to go into battle looking like a common soldier, much like the Antifa members. 
these leftist Antifa members, Black Lives Matter members, the, all these radicalized anarchists of today, they're all modern day Ahabs. And another thing that shows in this very chapter is that they're very courageous. Ahab is very courageous, just like Antifa, Black Lives Matter. They're very courageous in a group and from a distance. If they have distance from you, then, oh yeah, they'll, they'll speak all kinds of, they, they have no backbone. Okay, so Ahab is saying, okay, Benadad, everything, my wife, children, gold, silver, everything is yours. Everything that's mine is now yours. And the messengers of Benadad came again and unto Ahab and said, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children, yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. This would have politically just destroyed the capital of Israel and made them like dogs to the Syrians. Then the king of Israel, Ahab, called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold, and I denied him not. And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. Wherefore he said unto the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king all that thou didst send for to thy servant at the first I will do, but this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. And Ben-Hadad sent unto him and said, The gods do so unto me, and more also if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. He's basically saying, for all my people, we're going to take all your riches. We're going to take all your riches. We're not walking away with dust. If you'll recall, a little bit before this time, whenever Jezebel threatened Elijah's life, she said basically the same thing as Ben-Hadad, that God's do so unto me and more also if and such, such. So she threatens the life of Elijah, causing him great fear. Now we see the same fear smothering the house of Ahab and Jezebel by Ben-Hadad, an army greater than theirs, giving a little taste of their own medicine, you know. And God is great at that. The enemies of his children, he'll always, there's always a retaliation. And the king of Israel, Ahab, answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. This is that same courage from a distance that I talked about. Ahab never is this bold, but behind these walls in Samaria, which were high walls, behind the walls, he's he's pretty clever, you know. And Ben-Hadad doesn't take too kindly to this. And basically what this is saying, this you know, pretty much a provocation, what this is saying is do not boast before the battle but after you've won it. And it came to pass when Ben-Hadad heard this message as he was drinking, he and the kings in the pavilions, that he said unto his servants, set yourselves in array, and they set themselves in array against the city. He's obviously angered by this. Now notice the pride of Ben-Hadad right here. He believes that the battle's already won. He's getting drunk with all these chieftains. And they're celebrating victory before it even has occurred. That's how certain that they are that they're going to win. They have so many numbers that, but anyway, in Jeremiah forty nine sixteen, concerning God's judgment against Edom, it reads like this, and this is the way that God speaks to these types of enemies. Thy terribleness hath deceived thee, and the pride of thine heart, O thou that dwellest in the cliffs of the rock that holdest the height of the hill. Though thou shouldest make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. So it's not going to be Ahab 
or his army that does this. It's going to be God helping him. And a prophet is sent from God unto this evil king Ahab. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. He says, Ahab, Baal isn't helping you. Moloch's not helping you. Ashtaroth's not helping you. I will help you. Your only help. And indeed, all of our only help is the Lord God. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, Who shall order the battle? And he answered, Thou. Notice how uncertain Ahab is. He's already looking at it as he's going to die. That he's already, he's a defeated man. This is a very weak king. I can't say that enough. Then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, <clears throat> and they were 232. And after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being 7,000. Notice whenever Elijah says, I'm all alone, Lord. I'm the only one that serves you and all the northern kingdom of Israel. And God says, I have reserved for myself 7,000 other prophets besides you, Elijah. Well, these aren't those prophets, but notice God is going to use 7,000 Israelites to take on this huge multitude. And I believe that this is a show in how God can use such small numbers to bring great change. And they went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, the thirty and two kings that helped him. And the young men of the princes of the provinces went out first, and Ben-Hadad sent out, and they told him, saying, There are men come out of Syria, of Samaria. So all these Syrian kings and leaders, captains, they're all getting drunk. And they send these men on out, just spies or whatever. And they say, there's, there's people coming out of Samaria. Well, Ben-Hadad, he doesn't think anything about it. He's drunk. And he said, whether they be come out for peace, take them alive, or whether they be come out for war, take them alive. So these young men of the princes of the provinces came out of the city and the army which followed them, and they slew every one his man, and the Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with the horsemen. And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. And the prophet... The same prophet came to the king of Israel, Ahab, and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee again. This was a humiliating defeat at the, at the uh, hands of so few Israelites. But notice the attention that the servants of the king, how it shifts from the army of Israel unto the God that helped Israel. Just notice. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. So these Syrians are taking notice of this God of Israel. But they have a distorted view of him. But God... I believe he's desiring to prove himself primarily unto Israel and to Ahab. He's, he's saying, look, I'm the only true God. But now the Syrians are taking notice of him. And God, he, throughout the history of mankind, he has desired for the whole earth to acknowledge that he's God, not just in Israel. Notice what God says of the Pharaoh whenever the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt many hundred years before the Bible study right now. But he says this of the Pharaoh, And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. And then whenever the Israelites cross over the Red Sea, they remain unbelieving very quickly. They believe for a short time, and then very quickly they fall into unbelief. The psalmist says this, 
concerning that. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He says, I'm not going to do it for your sakes, you unbelievers. Just as he's working with pagans right now, he was working with pagans back then. They were wanting to follow the gods of Egypt. But he says, for his name's sake, that he might make his power known unto the whole world unto the whole world and there's instances all throughout making it very known that god desires all the earth to worship him and to acknowledge that he's the only god whenever joshua was leading the israelites after the death of moses whenever he's leading the israelites into the promised land they cross the jordan river the lord splits the jordan river just as he had split the red sea well joshua says this about that instance that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the lord that it is mighty that ye might fear the lord your god forever that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the lord he does these miracles so now we see these syrians taking notice of him but they're very foolish in it they say well his his power is only in the hills we need to fight in the plains and do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. And number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. It's believed that Aphek, see there's a couple of different places by that name. Here's a little commentary on this Aphek. There were, sev there were several places of this name, but as Ben-Hadad's policy was to fight in the plain, the Aphek here intended must be the city of that name which lay in the plain of Jezreel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them and the children of israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids but the syrians filled the country and there came a man of god and spake unto the king of israel and said thus saith the lord because the syrians have said the lord is god of the hills but he is not god of the valleys therefore will i deliver all this great multitude into thine hand and you shall know that i am the lord once again god's wanting to prove that he is the true God through this. And he's very displeased with the unbelief of the Syrians in him. Instead of saying, well, who is this God that gave them victory over us and over our gods? Instead of saying that and believing in him and following him, they're, they're raging against him, trying to trick him. Well, God's insulted by this. And this also goes to that old saying that God is a God of the hills and the valley. This is one of the verses that really uh, they derived that from. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians a hundred thousand footmen in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek and to the city, and there a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men that were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. So this wall falls. And it's believed that all the people of the army, they were lined up on the wall. That's how you protect a city. You actually get on the wall and shoot your arrows from there. That's how they've always done it. And it's believed that this wall just collapsed, like the walls of Jericho. It just collapsed, killing uh, 27,000 of them. So this would have just devastated the Syrian army. And his servants said unto him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads, and go out to the king of Israel. Peradventure he will save thy life. So they're saying, Beg for mercy from Ahab. And Ahab's such a weak man, of course he's going to do it. David, in my opinion, wouldn't have. And God is very displeased with Ahab for showing mercy unto him. But notice just a little saying, quick, a quick note. Put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads. This was basically like saying, uh, it's a servitude gesture, kind of like a leash on a dog. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, <clears throat> let me live. 
And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. What a fool. John Trapp commented on this. He said, This was not courtesy, but foolery. Brother Ben-Hadad will before long fight against Ahab with that life which he had given him. We'll see about that in chapter 22. It's the final chapter of 1 Kings. We'll see about how because Ahab didn't kill Ben-Hadad, Ben-Hadad comes back and kills Ahab. And that trips me up. He calls him his brother. He just tried to take not only your your kingdom and so, uh, sovereignty from you, but he tried to take your wives, your children, everything. Even your gold and silver. Take everything from you. Yeah, he's your brother, all right. Now the man did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, Thy brother Ben-Hadad. Then he said, Go ye, bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him, and he caused him to come up into the chariot. Now this is a peculiar verse to many. A lot of confusion on what this actually means. Now the man did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily. It's talking about the Syrians, Joseph Benson, uh, mentions this it's talking about how the syrian man once that they told ahab about the king benadad being alive <clears throat> then they watched his reaction to that and they're just observing what he's going to say and did hastily catch it meaning that they seized upon the opportunity to act on ahab's um mercy and even notice how quickly that they respond, thy brother Ben-Hadad. So there's, they're kind of shocked that he even refers to Ben-Hadad as his brother. So stupid Ahab has him come up in a chariot to him. And Ben-Hadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father I will restore, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor, And the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. So this prophet stands up, comes up to his neighbor, and he says, Smite me. Now he's doing this for a reason. Albert Barnes had very short comment on who may this prophet be. He was of the prophets. Josephus and others conjecture that this prophet was Micaiah, Micaiah the son of Imlah and whom we'll talk about in chapter 22. He's one of my favorite little-known prophets, Micaiah. I don't necessarily believe that it is Micaiah, but given the context, it may be. You see, Ahab, he has Micaiah imprisoned for some reason in chapter 22, and we're not told what that reason was. This would actually give a bit of the reason. But I do believe that the Bible would make mention that it was Micaiah. If it was Micaiah, I don't know. It's food for thought. So this son of the prophet, he asked his neighbor, one of his friends, to smite him. We're not told how to smite him. We're not told any of that. But we reckon it was just it's stabbing him or punching him, something. But his neighbor doesn't want to do that. Then said the prophet unto his neighbor, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. If you'll recall how the lion slew the other man of God, whom rebuked Jeroboam in uh, studies past 50 years before this or so, so it's believed that this neighbor that was killed by this lion may have also have been another prophet. And that's just referring to him as a neighbor, meaning something, someone of the same profession, if you will. We don't know. Anyway, 1 Kings twenty thirty seven. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him, so that in smiting he wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. Now this prophet is doing all of this in order to confront Ahab, the king of Israel, whom just spared Ben-Hadad and whom God wanted to die. But he just spared the king of Syria. So God sends this man who's wounded in order to display Something to Ahab. Now just watch. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king. And he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside. 
and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. So what this prophet is feigning to have been is a man from the battle between Israel and Syria. And he's, he's acting wounded from the battle. And he says that during the battle, a man came up to him and said, Here, you have to watch over this one man. Don't let him escape. It's presumed to be a prisoner of sorts, maybe something of that nature. But he says, Take this prisoner and watch over him during the battle. Well, he gets all busy and everything with the battle, and he the prisoner escapes. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thyself hast decided it. This is much like a Nathan and David scenario. Whenever Nathan comes in and rebukes David about the ewe lamb, and David pronounces his own judgment upon himself, so is this plan out again. And he hasted the prophet and took the ashes away from his face, and the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. This is the whole reason behind putting ashes upon his face, because Ahab would often, he would try to completely stay away from the prophets of the Lord. They never told him anything good. And Micaiah, as we'll learn in chapter 22, <laughs> Ahab actually says that. He says, you never tell me anything good. It's one of my favorite chapters. But um, this prophet, he immediately takes away these ashes, and he is recognized by the king. So this disguise was appropriate. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. One last quick Spurgeon comment, uh, commentary for us to end the study on is pretty appropriate. Remember the parable that the prophet tells the king? He says, I was in the midst of battle and um, a pr the prisoner that I was supposed to look over, he escaped. Well, that can be likened unto the fleeting opportunities of us as Christians and even of the lost in whom never do anything for the Lord. But Charles Spurgeon said this about such a thing. I want you all to remember this morning that if any portion of life has not been spent in God's service, it is gone. Time past is gone. You can never have it back again, not even the last moment which just now glided by. It's much like C.T. Spud said, Only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life hath been burnt out for thee. Very beautiful words. Only what's done for Christ will last. We get on with so much of this world and it's all fleeting. It's all going away. We should do the work of the Lord, build up treasures in heaven. As Jesus told us. That is the study for today. I thank you all. God of peace, love, and all mercy be with you. Amen.